Hello, guys, gals, non-binary pals, and waterfowls. It's me, Big Mike, and I want to welcome you to another episode of Coffee with Big Mike, the series where I sit down for a chat with some rather interesting and amazing people over a nice cup of coffee. This is a special episode today, fam, so unlike on previous installments of Coffee with Big Mike, this episode will be focused on talking about a specific topic, budget meal planning. And because we have an expert on the subject with us here today, in this episode, I will not be taking the lead in the conversation, but will give the floor over to her to take charge in this conversation. Also, because we have someone so knowledgeable on this subject with us today, at the end, there will be a special Q&A section included with questions submitted to us from various social media sites. So without further ado, I want to welcome my dear friend and fellow bird cult member, Honk Flap. Welcome, Honk Flap. Thank you, Mike. Great to be with you. How's it going today, fam? Uh, pretty good. Pretty good. It's hotter than hell's hinges, but it's summertime, so I guess I shouldn't expect anything less, eh? <laughs> you said it, fam. You said it. Ooh. Which is kind of odd, because in my part of the world, it's winter right now, and it's ooh, it's, it's a cold one today, fam. <laughs> you have no idea how jealous that makes me. It is so hot in here. Oh, get humid. Good Lord, I feel like a licked postage stamp. Fam, I, I, I had no idea I could get this cold in a tropical country. <laughs> 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 I'll trade you. I'll trade you. <laughs> now, before we get too far into this, you know, our fellow friend and fellow member of the bird cult, Kit, she always likes to know what we're drinking. Now, today I'm drinking a local coffee that's from an area in Indonesia called Sido Harcho. And it's my my drink today it has some a little bit of milk in it and some ginseng. What are you drinking on today? Ooh. Okay, well, not going to lie. I am a very budgety goose. And one of my indulgences is wine. But... As a budget goose, I am a box of wine kind of gal. And there is a wine called Delicious Red that I can pick up for 15 bucks a box. And I figured this is a special occasion. So I've got myself a glass of wine. And because it is so blooming hot in my neck of the woods right now, I've also got a giant bottle full of water and ice. I think that's a good combination to have. You know, and my guess... Yeah, I don't even... I don't even... Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, I don't even know if uh, if water is a combination for anything or just a constant in my current climate. Well, you know, you definitely got to stay hydrated, fam. You definitely got to stay hydrated. Too many things can go awry if you're not... You know, you can have a heat stroke. You can have... You can even get a UTI, apparently. So, yeah, always mm-hmm. need to stay hydrated. You, know, you got to hit that hydrate redeem very often. Now, I know true, you. True, true that. I know you. You know, you, you know uh, when, I, when I say you're my yeah, bestie, you, you know, that's not just kind of showing off. But, you know, we, me and Honk, we go back uh, maybe, what, two years at this point, maybe? I think we've been friends for... Yeah, you know, something around there. Something about that, yeah. So we've been going back and forth on Twitter. He was actually the one who introduced me to the bird cult. So... Yeah, so I know a lot about her. Yes, sir. And some of my audience probably knows about her as well. However, there's probably a great deal of my audience who does not know about her. So for my audience that aren't as familiar with you as I am, could you tell them a little bit about yourself? I would love to. So let me start with a disclaimer. I am not, by any stretch of the imagination... A registered dietitian, a certified public accountant, a lifestyle guru, anything like that. Everything that I know, I know for myself, from myself, through hard-won experience. So that's the place I'm talking to you from. But I don't have any real credentials, I guess you could say. So do keep that in mind. Everything I say is stuff that I do that helps me that works for me and keeps my little family, myself and my my beloved ducky and our big fat dog, happy and healthy. Everyone's different. And I there'll, there'll be things I'll be saying that won't work for everyone. There'll be things that people know that I don't. But I'm 
just giving it to you from the perspective of someone who has struggled and struggled hard and is still kind of on the grind. So, with that being said, two little points about that struggle. I won't go into any details on it, but things were dire enough that back in 2014 or so, I was living on the very drastic plan of one hot dog a day. (laughs) That was where I was food budget-wise. And by a hot dog, I mean a piece of bread, a weenie, and some mustard. That was all I had to eat in a day. And I have come so far since then, and I have learned so much since then. And I really want to tell people what I learned, because I wish someone who had learned this before me had told me. It would have made things much easier. Also, I am passionate on this topic because it really just ruffles my feathers the way food is marketed, especially through social media and through major advertising. We have a serious issue with this dichotomy that's set up. Food is either healthy and it is whole, and it is Instagrammable, and it is expensive, and it is curated, or it is cheap, and it is affordable, and it is processed, and it comes together quickly. And those two things, they're illusions. You can eat whole, nutritious food for the same budget, basically, that you can live on weenies and box mac and cheese than ramen noodles. You can, you can do that. But there's a real disconnect in our society between what is healthy, what is you know, sustainable, what is the, this, this whole aesthetic, and realistically what whole food looks like. So that's why I'm here, that and to hang out with my bestie. And I just want to point out for our listeners at home who, are, who aren't familiar with us, when she says her ducky, she means her her significant other. She doesn't mean like a literal duck. This is true. I call my... Okay, th- that's a cute little story. Back when I first started dating my husband, I started calling him Cuddle Duck. And one day he was just like, well, fine, if I'm a duck, you're a goose. And everyone actually knows us now as like ducky and goosey. That's... That, that, that's our whole, not just online, like our real life people are like, yo, duck, what's up? <laughs> that's just how we roll. <laughs> when you previously, you mentioned this type of mindset or lifestyle, you know, that's marketed on social media and through advertisements. Would it be fair to say that this type of mentality is intentionally marketed, do you think? Absolutely. 100%. Social media is designed to keep you clicking and they do that so well through kind of inge- kind of uh, generating within us envy. This lady who has such a beautiful, spacious, airy kitchen, who looks so healthy and so energetic, is going to show you her easy morning routine where she's got organic strawberries and acai berries and chia seeds and all of that going into her pre-workout smoothie. That's something you can look at and just fall down a rabbit hole and think, I wish I was there. I wish I was like her. I wish this and that. And and that's that that is designed by an algorithm for engagement. Now, if you by all means, if you have acai berry money just laying around and that's what you want to do with it, there is I have no problem with that. By all means, live your life, you know? But what the things that make you happy, the things that you can reasonably afford, do it. And if you're pulling in acai berry money, I am happy for you. But that is not what health necessarily looks like. And it's marketed that way to people on on social media platforms. And what do you think is a good way that people can get out of that type of mindset? Okay, it's by, and and it took me forever to figure this out. It is not by thinking about what you should be doing or what you wish you were doing. It's about looking at what you can do and the circumstances that you are in and framing that in your mind. This is where I am. This is what I'm dealing with. I'm going to do the best job I can, and I am going to be proud of myself for doing it. That uh, It took ages for that to click click for me, to be able to say to myself when I'm putting 
a maybe a humble dinner on the table. And I know in my head I am feeding myself and my husband for like a dollar seventy four. But it's all wholesome, whole foods, and it tastes good. I look at that and I say, Good job, Goose. Well done. You you did a good thing there. It's hard sometimes to prop yourself up for things that you do. We're in a world of external validation. Whether it's good or bad depends on how many likes you get. But really, you're the one who is living your life. Give yourself some space and give yourself some grace. Do what you can do and celebrate your own accomplishments. Just add a boy or add a girl yourself. That's more important than anything social media has to offer us. Now, in your particular situation, was there a, like an aha moment that got you? Like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I don't have to live like this. You know, the, this lifestyle that is more healthy, that's affordable, is in my grasp. Something I can realistically do. And if so, what was your aha moment? It wasn't so much the affordability aspect of it, but I did have a, an aha moment, and I'll tell you what it is. Ages ago, back in my, you know, one hot dog a, a day diet plan there that I was on, I had gotten accustomed to, I mean, like dinner for the two of us was going to be in the dollar range, basically, you know? And one thing, when my... My husband had been working on the road at that time, and that was part of the reason we were so poor, but that's a whole story I won't bore anybody with. But he got back, he got a job at a, at a local Walmart, which, you know, is not exactly big bucks, but at least he wasn't driving all around the country, so, you know, that helped some. But one thing that uh, we started buying was, you know, the Kraft macaroni and cheese in the blue box? At this time, you could get those for $0.33 cents a piece in the store brand. And so I would just stock those things like crazy, right? Well, he wasn't a huge fan of necessarily the store brand ones, but he loved the original Kraft Blue Box macaroni and cheese. He was raised on it as a kid, so it had like a nostalgia for him, right? So now that's, you know, it was about 99 cents back in those days. And okay, we've got a little extra money. Let's just, you know, put it into this macaroni and cheese. That, that makes a fast, easy dinner, by the way. You dump a can of tuna and a can of peas and a box of that, Bada bing, bada boom, you got a dinner, right? So he loves it. He just, he, he loves it. And so we, we would keep it on and I would make it, you know, two, three nights a week. And one day I made, a, you know, a batch of it up and we ate yeah, maybe half of it, two thirds of it or something. And I am a big fan of saving my leftovers and reincorporating them into other meals or having them for lunches or whatever. I do not like to waste food. So it went in a little container in the uh, refrigerator. And unfortunately for us, or for me, it went into the refrigerator on a Wednesday night. Thursday, every other Thursday, is our uh, grocery day. Because he's always been paid bi-weekly, and his check hits on a Thursday. So he comes home Thursday night with all of these groceries. We stocked the fridge, and that little container with macaroni and cheese got shuffled all the way to the back of the fridge. And literally six weeks later, I was cleaning my refrigerator out, and I found it. And when I opened that container of macaroni and cheese, fully expecting to see a science project in there, right? I opened it up, and it looked like I had made it that day. Oh. And it freaked me out. I was like, oh my God, this is not food. How could it have sat in there so long and still not? This is plastic. I'm eating plastic. What else could it be? And when he got home, I showed it to him. And I was like, look at this. Do you remember the last time I made this? And he was like, no. And I was like, my guy, it's been like six weeks. Why isn't there any mold on it? Even the microbes won't eat this stuff. That can't be a good sign. And... That's when I really started looking into the difference between processed foods and whole foods. Because good grief, if you can't get a mold spore to eat something, it's probably not something I should be eating either. That is a fantastic point, actually. That is a very fantastic point. You know, I've never heard it phrased quite like that. I've seen some kind of similar fangs. I, I don't know if you ever saw Super Size Me, which it was one of my it's one of my favorite uh, documentary yes. oh, films. That, oh, yes, it's a very good one. That McDonald's stuff oh yeah so and on the dvd they had like a special feature were were i think his name was morgan spurlock if i'm not mistaken morgan he took he uh, took several foods like a couple of burgers couple uh, like a chicken sandwich a fish sandwich and some fries from mcdonald's and he put them each in a separate vat 
you know, closed off from the outside. Then he got like a burger and fries from a mom and pop place to keep in a separate vat as well mm-hmm. to, to kind of measure how long it would take them to decompose. Well, after a day or two, the mm-hmm. mom and pop burger sort of decomposed. You know, uh, maybe the day after that, you know, the fries from the mom and pop place started to decompose. Now, after about a week or two, the, the sandwiches from McDonald's, after two or three months of sitting in the vat, the fries from McDonald's had the, the fries from McDonald's had no sign of decomposure, no mold, absolutely nothing, absolutely nothing. Right, so and that's scary. Absolutely. Well, it makes you think, how could this be a potato? I mean, we, we know what potatoes are, right? That's that's not how potatoes act. So how how in the world is this a potato? <laughs> well, you know, because it's full of chemicals. Uh, and I'm not trying to be a tinfoil hat person or they're all to get us or whatever. But food that is primarily chemical in composition is much easier and cheaper to produce. And that's why it is marketed to low-income people. It's terrible. But you won't... Silliest point ever. But if you look at the statistics for things like obesity and then link them to income my my guy it's poor people who are fat and it's it's because of what we can afford to eat for the most part or what we think we can afford to eat that is terrible food and so the idea my idea is how do i break this and i've got a couple of notions that i think people listening might find helpful so today, I want to talk to you about whole foods that I find very accessible and very affordable. I want to talk about how I arrange things into a modular pantry that makes it almost seamless to plug things in and out. And then some some budget shopping tips, a couple of recipe ideas, things like that. But if you have the foundational knowledge, then you can look at where you are and say, hey, Here's my situation. Here's this knowledge I've acquired. What can I do where I am in my life right now is going to benefit me? And as I had previously stated, I am not scientistic. I do not have any kind of degrees or anything, but I can tell you for myself that when I stopped eating as much processed food, my diet at one point was almost entirely processed food and began eating primarily a whole foods diet, my energy level increased. And I, by the way, this is, I forgot to mention that, I suffer from a chronic pain condition and I uh, have you know, struggles with fatigue and things like that. The, the amount of chronic pain I was in probably dropped by about 20%. And that's a win I'll take all day. 20% less pain is, that, that's worth something to me. You know what I mean? Absolutely. You got to take what you can get. You got to take what you can get when it comes to pain management. You know, sometimes, you know, you're in a situation where you can't get rid of your pain completely. So you have to, you know, you have to try to reduce it as much as possible. And any little bit helps. Any minor lifestyle change that can reduce that is definitely a win. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, There's a famous saying, something like, you know, perfection is the enemy of the good. Or something like that. If you can, if you like me, and you may not be like me at all, but if you like me, uh, have these chronic pain problems and find that eating a more whole food based diet drops your pain by 20%, then it's a hundred percent better than waiting around for that hundred percent thing that's never going to come. I find that's true of just about everything. When I was younger, I, I was a perfectionist. I, now that I'm a middle-aged goose, I am not a perfectionist at all. I'm doing my best out here, <laughs> and I think that's all I can expect out of myself. Amen to that, fam. Let me tell you what. I'm a middle-aged myself, or I'm pretty close to it if I'm not quite there yet, but... <laughs> I definitely, I, I stopped trying to be perfect a long time ago and just try just to enjoy my life for what it is. So, yep. No, oh, you are where you are. There's no sense in not finding some happiness or some joy there. <laughs> There's just no good reason not to try, right? Absolutely. That's all, that's all you can do is try. That's absolutely all you can do is try. So I guess with all of that in mind, maybe we could start thinking about or talking about some of the ways in which we can move our lives in a more healthy direction by in a more you know economic friendly direction and so 
in order to do that, perhaps maybe we need to consider what are some of the things or some of the equipment or tools a person would need in order to adopt this type of lifestyle? Okay, that's a great question. And I have, I've got opinions. I have certainly got opinions. You can do everything that I talk about with a basic kitchen loadout. If you have a big pot, most of the things that I'm going to say, you can do in that big pot. However, and this is a great time for me to bring this up, when you are looking at your, let's just put a big bubble up that says food, right? When you're thinking about food and your food budget, you not only have to look at the actual physical cost of the food and the actual nutritional value of the food, it is crucial that you look at the time investment that preparing that food is going to cost, and the satisfaction that you're going to derive from it uh, in terms of like variety and things. All four of those things are in a push and pull under that big circle of food. And for me, the best solution is to have a crock pot. I cannot, I can't even, oh, I guess I could even, but I wouldn't want to even without a crock pot. Those are reasonably uh, inexpensive. I believe a new one at Walmart is around $25. You can probably find them at thrift stores. Uh, If you've got, you know, family that buys you Christmas presents or anniversary presents or something, maybe, you know, ask for one of those. Aside from a big pot, a crock pot is going to be your best friend. Also, and again, around the $20 price point at Walmart is a rice cooker. That is something that will save you a load of time. It, it just it streams it streamlines the process of making rice. If you have and I, I won't even like there's a million tutorials on YouTube about how to make rice. That's how I learned. They're, they're all out there, but it takes about 20 minutes. But it's a very ticky thing. You have to turn the rice off to let it steam at a very certain point in its cooking. And if you do it just a little bit wrong, you scorch it on the bottom of the pan and then your or pot and then you're scrubbing it for hours or. To me, it feels like hours when I've tried to scrub burnt rice off the bottom of a pot. An air, or I mean, a rice cooker will let you put your rice in, turn it on, and have 20 minutes or so to work on your other cooking or to start a the laundry or whatever. Love a rice cooker. And the last thing that I personally love is an air fryer. Now, that's kind of pie in the sky. Those are a little more expensive, and they're not necessarily practical in all situations. I happen to have one. And I adore it. But if that's not in your budget right now, try again next year. You know, it's not that big of a deal. Maybe Christmas will roll around again and you can ask for an air fryer from your your mama or your best friend or your spouse or whatnot. But those are the biggest things in terms of kitchen equipment that I would want people to have. Big pot, almost a given. Crock pot, close second. And then maybe a rice cooker. Air fryer optional, but great. Now... If you go to a place like the Dollar Tree, you can find storage containers, you know, little plastic tubs with the snap-on lids. You can also find those at Walmart. They're just likely cheaper at the Dollar Tree, but you're going to need an assortment of those. You want a couple of real big ones because you do want to store food and you do want to be able to save your leftovers and prep things you know, in advance and such like that. So those dollar store containers are great. If for whatever reason you can't afford those right off the bat, a package of freezer bags would work. And it is good to have markers if you're going to use freezer bags so you can write on them what's in the bag. So those are my like equipment dreams right there. And for the most basic list, my absolutely, this is my, my basic, 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 basic pantry idea here. What I always keep in my house, rice, beans, lentils, eggs, cabbage, onions, carrots, potatoes, and cooking oil. If you have all those things and some seasonings, you've got a number of different meals you can make and you have got whole food and it's wholesome and it is good for you and none of these things are difficult. I prepared a little something if you'll indulge me, Mike. As of today, which is the uh, 17th of July, 2023, I have gone to walmart.com, which, to be fair, has probably geolocated me in my area. So your, your mileage may vary if you're in New York City or something. But walmart.com right now, 
lists a 20-pound bag of rice, and that's the one I buy, for $11.14. This is fundamental to my plan. I cannot express to you how much rice 20 pounds of rice actually is. It is incredible how long 20 pounds of rice will last. Now, we're a family of two, and obviously you'd go twice as fast if you were a family of four adults, but you're going to get at least a month or six weeks of meals out of 20 pounds of rice. And they also list eight pounds of pinto beans for six eighty eight. I never, ever go without having pinto beans. And I do buy them in the eight-pound bag. Right there, rice and beans. If all else fails, I have rice and beans. I can go to bed every night knowing that if something comes up, my husband's car needs work, my dog needs to go to the vet, something happens, and I have to forego buying groceries, we could eat rice and beans for a couple of weeks and not be that much worse to wear for it. So definitely rice and beans. And I'll talk a little bit more about that if you kind of want to dig into the, the, the weeds a little bit about like what my, my basic shopping list looked like. There are a few other things that I love to keep on hand. Things like uh, applesauce, sauerkraut. Those are big things for me. Uh, I love to keep a collection of spices together that go into my three different palettes that I keep. Spice palettes. But um. For sure. If you've got rice, lentils, beans, cabbage, onions, carrots, potatoes, and oil, you you are set. And you can probably pick most of that up for $35, roughly. And I would go ahead and and point out here that if you are just starting out, you are horrible hard-pressed. You don't have to buy that 20 20 pound bag of rice at once. What we're trying, we're trying to get there now, guys, because we're talking about economy of scale. The more of something you buy, the less it costs per unit, right? But if all you can afford right now is a two-pound bag of rice and a one-pound bag of beans, yeah, that, that is what it is. You're going to want to kind of nickel and dime your way up to that big one because that is the bang for your buck. But again, you are where you are and you can do what you can do. So don't feel bad if you can't immediately drop $11 on rice. I do have a couple of questions I want to ask here. Perfect. So firstly, do you think rice could be replaced with anything? Like, would it be possible to replace it with another grain like pasta or instant potatoes? Absolutely. It is absolutely possible to do that. The reason that I have rice here is because it is the most affordable option. It is by far the most affordable of those options. I can't buy 20 pounds of pasta for $11. So that's why I'm on on the rice train. But if... If you really prefer pasta, and instead of $11, you can afford $20 to spend in pasta and have 20 pounds of, you know, macaroni noodles or spaghetti or whatever, and you've got the space to store that, that's absolutely, you can do that. Any kind of whole grain that you can get, that you can mix with any kind of bean pulse or legume, is going to give you a, uh, a whole protein. The amino acids in those carbs and in those beans, pulses, and legumes match up to make a full protein. And that's where so much of this budget comes in. Meat is expensive. I use meat primarily as a flavoring. That's not because I have some particular dietary reason to do that. I'm not trying to be a vegetarian or I don't have like particular concerns around, I don't know, cholesterol or anything along those lines. But for me, meat has become prohibitively expensive. I'll tell you something, Bestie. I just about fell over the first time I went into a grocery store and they wanted $5.99 a pound for hamburger meat. I was like, what? Excuse me? I don't think so. Not today. What, am I made out of money? No, not today. That would be if I used half a pound a dinner for my my ducky and I. That would be $2.50 just on the protein. So now instead of making one $2 dinners, I'm already above my normal, you know, price per serving kind of a thing. And I still haven't put in vegetables or carbohydrates or anything like that. 
you're already breaking my bank. I'm not, not great with that. I'm not great with that. Now, I'm not saying you can't ever have hamburger meat. You can, if, if your budget allows for it, or, 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 if you can find it on sale as a loss leader at one of your grocery stores or on clearance. That's the trick. You get it when it's at a really, really good price. But I would never pay full price for meat. Uh, any kind of meat. I would not pay full price for it. Absolutely not. It is ludicrous how much that costs. I might be getting a little bit ahead of ourselves here when I ask this question. So if you if you plan on to elaborate on this later, let me know and we'll save it to, until then. But are there any seasonings that you'd recommend every kitchen to have? Yes, there are. And you are right on target. That was the next thing I was going to talk about. So again, pricing it all out today at my local Walmart. This is the biggest like flux for me. I can buy two pounds of Nor Chicken Bouillon for $5.78. And my specific Walmart carries it in the chicken and the chicken tomato flavors. Now, there are other places, <laughs> many other places, bigger, better places to, to shop, that are going to have, uh, Nor makes a, a vegetable stock one, and I believe a beef one as well. But those, those stocks, my husband and I were just laughing about this two nights ago or so. This coming up week, the grocery list is going to have those back on it. And that will be the first time I have bought the chicken stock powders in over a year. And I can't tell you how great it is to be able to make up chicken broth or a reasonable facsimile thereof in a matter of seconds just by putting water into it. And it goes forever. I use the chicken and tomato one to make rice for every single Mexican dish I make. And I make a lot of Mexican food. So that for sure. Some of the other seasonings that I really love. And let's, uh, yeah, let's, let's go ahead and get into this. Myself personally, I in my pantry, which I consider to be modular, I like to buy Italian style seasonings, Mexican style seasonings, and Asian style seasonings. So think of it kind of like a design palette. Yeah, like you're on Tumblr or Instagram and you're looking at, I don't know, wallpaper swatches or whatever, right? You, know, you use this color palettes, this matches this, matches this, right? If you are just starting out and you like Italian food, like, like I like Italian food, then a little shaker of Italian seasoning is the way to go. Uh, onion powder. I find that to be perfect for any seasoning palette. Love onion powder. Got that in there. If you really love Asian food, and we do, I like to have soy sauce all the time. And that is, incidentally, don't don't sleep on the Dollar Tree, folks. You can get soy sauce at the Dollar Tree. And by that same token, the teriyaki sauce at the Dollar Tree, in my opinion, is better than any of the ones they sell at Walmart. So, obviously, I would want you to have the bouillon. But you need to think, when you're shopping for these spices, what are my favorite foods, writ large? Maybe start with an Italian seasoning a uh, for the Italian food. Cumin. Goes a long way in Mexican food and soy sauce for Asian. If you can only buy three, those would be the three I would buy with my particular palate. But if you like other kinds of foods, if you like Cajun foods or you like hot and spicy foods or you like kind of the Midwestern style comfort foods, all of those things are, you know you. You know what you want. You know what your family wants. Pick the palettes that work best for you. Get your spices at the Dollar Tree or at Walmart. The start off with those, you know, dollar a bottle ones. If they don't seem good, like they're kind of bland or not really kicking right, it's because they're dry. They're old and they're dry. And you can fix this by lightly toasting them in a hot pan. 30 seconds or so until they're fragrant. That brings spices right back to life. And as you have, you know, proceed on in the months to follow where you've got no problems at buying rice, you've got beans running out of your ears, then splurge some and buy different kinds of spices. That's where you go in for your cilantro lime seasoning rubs and your, your mirins or your uh, oyster sauces or whatever. And also another fun trick. Buy things that are clearanced out at Walmart or weird little things that you find at Dollar Tree. Uh, a couple of months ago, there is a product called Flavor Up 
by Campbell's, the soup company that I had never heard of and was at Dollar Tree, and it was a caramelized onion and a garlic and herb flavor, and it's like concentrated flavor goo gel at $1.25 I bought them. They're tasty. I use them to f- to flavor my beans, actually. And when they're gone, they're gone. But whichever flavors you want, whatever you want to do, just try to keep it to two or three and buy things within those palettes. Then when you've got a good pantry stock, but spices are going to last a long time. It's going to take you a, a day or two to work through a bottle of ground ginger. Uh, that's not something that's going to be on your grocery list every week, no matter how hard you try. So, you know, just build up your stock and try to keep it in those three palettes. Keep those front and center. And any other fun thing you find, like your caramelized onion flavor goo, it'll be a little one-off, a little something to shake things up, change things around. That's all well and good. But if you focus on two or three flavor palettes that your family really loves, that's going to get you places. I want to backtrack for a moment. Now, you mentioned a a nice little trick, a handy sounding trick to revive a spice that maybe has lost its, you know, its zing, its pizzazz due to age. You you mentioned toasting it lightly for 30 seconds. Yes, sir. How many times do you think you could use that trick Mm -hmm. with a a particular singular spice? Well, what you would do, like, for instance, if you and I were making chili together and you handed me uh, an old dusty bottle of chili powder, I would take out two tablespoons of it, toast it, and put it right in my meal. So you could do that until the bottle's gone. Ah, I see. So you're not, you're not toasting it and then putting it back in the bottle. No, sir. I'm doing it a a serving at a time. A serving at a time. That just kind of shows how much I know about cooking. So just, <laughs> um, so this is very much a learning, just as yeah, much a well, learning experience for me as it is for all of you. So, um. <laughs> well, th- there's no shame in that because uh, let's not talk about how much I know about Linux. Oh, don't put me on the spot. Which would be, I know the name of it. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, uh, uh. (laughs) We all have our strengths and our weaknesses. My particular strength happens to be food because I've been fighting this battle for a long time. But, you know, everyone, everyone has their own, their own little spot, whether you credit yourself for it or not. And you should. Everyone's good at something. Amen to that. Amen to that, bestie. I wholeheartedly agree. You know, and there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with not knowing something. You know, we're all we're all ignorant about something, and I- ignorance is nothing to be ashamed of. Well, well, no, you can only know what you know. How could it be otherwise? <laughs> when you think about it, if you don't know something, you simply don't. And if no one's brought it up to you or told you how to f- explain it to you or told you where to find information about it, I mean. If you don't know, if it's never occurred to you that you can revive spices by toasting them in a hot skillet for 30 seconds or so, why in the world would you ever wake up one day and think, I'm going to Google if I can toast spices? Yeah, of course you wouldn't. <laughs> that's just silliness. That's just silliness. That's a very good point. That's a very we know what we know. Yeah we, we, yeah, we know what we know. We live, we grow, we learn, and hopefully we share what we learn with other people. That, that, that's kind of kind of based. Well, that's actually the whole philosophy cool. behind behind this whole adventure. You know, we're on right now is to kind of share knowledge, share what we know, so that knowledge doesn't stay up at the top, you know, or among you know a select few people. But knowledge should be knowledge is a lot like a love or happiness. It's best when shared. It's best when shared. I agree, a hundred percent. And so that's really the whole philosophy behind I this, that. and or having your own. So absolutely. Absolutely. After spices, what else would you recommend? Okay. Now, I I have mentioned this before, but I kind of glossed over it. I cannot tell you how much flavor onions add to everything that you cook. After salt, onions add more flavor to food than any other single item. I always have onions. And here's a fun little tip. This is just what I do. Again, it won't work for everyone if you're working two jobs or you've got three toddlers pulling at you all day long. This may not be viable for you, but for me. When I get onions, I will buy them right now. It's the summertime, so I can get the sweet onions, like the Vidalias. Uh, When I can't get them, I go with whatever's cheapest, which is usually the Spanish or yellow onions. Sometimes it's the white ones. You know, whatever. 
But when I get onions, I'll buy two, three pounds at a time. I will sit my booty butt down. I will pull my little Chromebook that I'm working off of here out and put on some YouTube videos. And this is probably not going to surprise anybody. I like to watch the budget food girlies talk about what they're doing. Because that gives me ideas for meals that I might want to make, right? I'll put them on for a little company. If you're not a cooking nerd like me, maybe you want to log into a podcast or something. But I will sit there and chop that entire three-pound bag of onions and put it in a plastic container with an airtight lid and put it in my fridge. That there is going to save me an indefinite amount of time throughout the week because now onions go in everything and I'm not dealing with all the little skins and I'm not making my eyes water over and over again and I'm not spending 10 minutes chopping an onion. All my onions are chopped and they go. I do the same thing with my cabbages. Cabbages are beautiful. They are a cruciferous vegetable, which is like kind of in the same family as broccoli, Brussels sprouts, and cauliflower. They're great for nutrition. They're great for fiber. And if you think you hate cabbage and you've only ever had it in coleslaw, or like my ducky used to only ever have it coming from a kind of a deep south family where it was just boiled to the point of a war crime and so saggy and slimy and farty, then let me just tell you, cabbage is great. And the trick to that is toss it with a little fat, dealer's choice, but I often just use cooking spray on the top of it, aerosol cooking spray. Put it with some onions, toss it in the oven, and let it roast. Just don't crowd your pan because it will steam instead of roast, but roast it off for 15, 20 minutes, get a little char on it. It is great. It is fabulous. It is utterly delicious, and it's also brilliant in a stir fry. Stir fry is like a dream. But yeah, you're not going to get more flavor out of anything really than a than onions. Gotta love those onions. And I do love to prep them, my onions, my cabbage and stuff, in advance. Just sit down and do it once. So as I'm cooking, I'm just doing the old grab and grow, go thing. Which brings me back to one of the reasons I think you need a crock pot. I like to have, I have a big, great big container with a lid. And I will make up, my crock pot will fit three pounds of dried beans soaked. Because, you know, beans, one, one, cup of dried beans turns into three cups of cooked beans. I've got a big crock pot, but it'll only handle three pounds at a time, and then it's like full to the lid. But I will do up an entire crock pot full of beans, because I can set that up while I'm asleep, and just let it cook overnight. Then I transfer what I'm going to eat for the week into a container with a lid, put the rest in another container or a freezer bag, and freeze it. Beans freeze beautifully. And I like to do the same thing with my rice. Cook it up in advance. Take out what I'm going to need for the week. Put that in the fridge. Store the rest in the freezer. And that way, yeah, you know, I am. I, I'm good to go all week long. By doing a little of that pre prep, I find that it saves my time. And this is coming from a person who is not necessarily so busy because I've got a bustling career and a young family and all of this. I'm talking about as a person who has chronic pain issues. There's only so long I can stand in the kitchen and chop vegetables. There's only so long I can do any number of tasks. So I like to do them in batches and not have to worry about it for the rest of the week or two weeks. I hope that was coherent. I may have rambled. That was coherent. I get weirdly excited about my rice, beans, and cabbage. Like, weirdly so. It's almost a problem. But, I mean, I can't tell you how great they are. Like, just in in terms of, of giving you that, oh, vegetables are fantastic for you and onions give you so much flavor and the rice and beans are so much protein and it's also crazy cheap compared to buying certainly compared to buying meat but even buying box food right now at my dollar tree i can choose to buy if i'm in the dollar tree i can buy a pound of white rice a pound of brown rice or six packs of ramen noodles now which one do you think is going to be best for me what choice should i be making there Definitely the rice. Absolutely. Absolutely. Which is kind of bringing me into another point. Let me make sure that I 100% clarified what I mean by modular pantry. I feel like I might have gotten off track there a little bit. But let me just say, a modular pantry is going to be something where you have your seasoning palettes and your basic pantry goods set to 
two or three of your favorite kinds of cuisines. And let me tell you, here, here's just one example. I said I'd give an idea for a recipe, right? So my favorite bean, which happens to be the least expensive, but it's pinto beans. And that's probably because I may be in the deep south now, but I am from South Texas, and I am a Texas girl at heart. So I am pinto all the way. I am team pinto. If you want to get black beans, get black beans. If you want to get red beans, get red beans. Get, get, get the bean that speaks to you. And I do advocate, once you've got a nice stockpile of your beans, to add into that, to buy lentils, to buy black-eyed peas, to buy chickpeas, those kinds of things, right? But one of my absolute go-tos that I have done a million billion times is to take my pinto beans, which, like I said, I pre-cook in the crock pot and have them ready to go, throw them into a skillet with a little bit of water, get them warm, run my meat ma- my uh, potato masher through them, which is a little doodad you can pick up at the Dollar Tree, or you can use a fork, you know, whatever, but get them all mashed up to my required or my preferred consistency, which is slightly on the chunky side. And just like that, I have refried beans. So now I'm going to take my rice and I'm going to flavor that up with maybe some salsa or some taco seasoning or some of that nor powder, whatever you like. And I'm going to have rice and beans, and then I'm going to put that in a bowl or in a tortilla and dress it with whatever I have. If I have fresh cilantro, that's great. If I have fresh onions, and I always do, those are going on top. If sauce is good, I think I've already said that, hot sauce is good. If you've got cheese laying around, or if avocados are on sale in your area, whatever, whatever you like. But I make burrito bowls or burritos like that so often. It's not even funny. And they're delicious. And none of this requires me to buy hamburger meat or chicken to do it. So, yay. And honestly, once once your beans are prepped already, <laughs> dinner will come together in 20 minutes. If your rice is prepped already, even less, you know? Great stuff. Great stuff. Love those. And I do the same thing with an Asian kind of rice bowl where I'll have a bowl of rice, put myself some soy sauce on it, Stir fry up a little bit of cabbage, put it on the side there, and fry an egg. And put a fried egg with a runny yolk on top. Whew, that's a good rice bowl. I I am a sucker for a runny egg. Oh my god, bestie. Let me tell you what. Fam, if you you ever want to seduce Big Mike with food, give him a burger, give him ramen, give him french fries, give him rice. Pretty much you can't go wrong with any food and put a fried runny egg on top of it. I love it when the when the egg yolk just bursts and just kind of flows all over. Oh my god. Ooh. It creates a sauce. It creates a brilliant sauce. A creamy, delicious, ooh, unctuous kind of a sauce. And with the umami from the uh, soy sauce and the rice, a little bit of cabbage, you know, you stir fried up for some crunch. Maybe you stir fried some carrots and onions in there too. Man, my goodness. But that's, I mean, those are good meals. Those are wholesome meals. Those are easy to put together meals. And those are meals that are on par in cost per unit to any box nonsense you're going to buy. Oh, you're going to laugh about this, but I can't talk about food without shouting out sardines. (laughs) Because I came late to the sardine party, and I am now a sardine evangelist. (laughs) I'm not going to lie. I came very late to the sardine party. Throughout my life, I have had pets. Some of my pets have had dry skin. My current dog has dry skin. So it wasn't too long ago that I was buying cans of sardines and acting like it was killing me to open them up and feed him sardines for the uh, fish oil to help his skin. I've had cats in the past with dry skin, did the same thing. Never considered eating them. And then I watched so many people talk about how good sardines are. And they are not what you think. If you are freaking out about sardines, they're about the same, quote, fishiness level of tuna, but with the richness of salmon. And the real trick to making them pop is to cook them, or not cook them, heat them. Which I'm not saying you can't throw a couple of sardines, some mayo, and a slice of onion on two pieces of bread and call it a day. Sardine sandwiches are... An old-fashioned thing, but they've they've been popular before. But, oh my gracious, one of the easiest lunches that I love to do, and I cannot overstate the nutritional value of sardines. They are so healthy for you. 
and depending on where you get them, depending on, will depend on the price, and also the quality of the sardines makes a difference to how flavorful they are. The cheapest ones, which I can get at the Dollar Tree, are kind of mid in terms of flavor, but once you've heated them up, you're not doing too bad for yourself. So what I will do is I will take sardines and mash them with brown mustard. You could use any kind of mustard you like in this, but I mash them up with mustard. I toast a piece of bread, cut it into three pieces, smear the sardine paste on top of it, and then put whatever I happen to have. If I've got some sprinkled Parmesan cheese, not very wholesome, but, you know, it's a vibe. It goes with Italian food. It's very inexpensive. Uh, Or a red chili flake or whatever I've got. Pop it back in the oven to let it broil for a minute or two. That is such a good lunch. Oh, good heavens, that's such a good lunch. Like I said, it's the, the richness of salmon and the basically the flavor of tuna. Absolutely love sardines. And if you think I'm out of my mind, just go onto Pinterest or onto YouTube or something and type in sardine recipes. It will blow your mind at how much you can do with sardine mess recipes. And one of the great things about them is that they're a pantry staple item, so you don't have to put up, you know, with space in your fridge or whatever. But I'm telling you, that 3.5 ounces of sardines is more than enough to feed a family of four because the flavor is just so good. Oh, good heavens. Sorry. You've heard all this before privately, haven't you, Mike? Oh, absolutely. But I just want to I just want to testify for a moment. You know, I've been kind of taking a back seat here today. Uh, we're not, not adding much because I want to let you to do your thing, Bessie, because, you know, this is your area of expertise. But I just want to come in and for a moment to testify about this. My wife, is a huge fan of sardines and there's something that can be made fast and easy and they're, they're relatively cheap as well now when i was in the united states i never had sardines they kind of sounded disgusting to me like i think a lot of people they kind of have that vibe that idea oh sardines are disgusting they're fishy they have a horrible smell you know, they're gonna make your breath stink you know just just avoid them at all costs and i, w- I was kind of in that same mindset as well but when i came here you know and, I, and after i got married to my wife my wife loves to keep sardines on you know in our pantry just in case you know we're in a tight situation and she can't cook a you know a full meal or, you know, she's had a hard day and she doesn't feel like, you know, cooking a full meal. Throw some rice in the rice cooker, you know, and warm up some sardines. And, and bada bing, bada boom, uh, bestie. Best. Uh, one of the best meals you can have. You know, relatively low effort. I, yes, indeed. Absolutely. I, I, I tell you, sardines are not promoted enough. Sardines are I, my, one of my proudest moments. I found at a grocery store relatively local to me, Chicken of the Sea brand sardines. They had them on sale, 88 cents a can. And I saw that, and I immediately texted my ducky, and I was like, when you get off work, I need you to buy me 10 cans of sardines. And he was like, you need 10 cans of sardines? What are you doing? (laughs) What is happening? (laughs) Do I need to come home now? Is there a problem? (laughs) Why in the world do you need 10 cans of sardines? But because I wasn't going to let a price like that pass me by is why. Oh, my gosh. Yes, I got I got 10 meals out of that. <laughs> I'll tell you what. And correct me if I'm wrong. Here, he thought it, correct me if I'm wrong here, but they last for a long time, yeah. right? Oh, yeah, yeah. They're shelf stable and will last well, just like tuna several years. So wh- when you see them on sale and you, you know, you may need to try them. This is this is not actually anything I had prepared, but I have told this to people before, and I stand by this. If you have tried something once and you didn't like it, you're not giving it a fair shake. You need to try something as an adult human who is in charge of your own emotions around food. You need to try something three times. So if you get some sardines and you don't like them, maybe try another brand, maybe try another preparation, but just give them a shake. I came late to the sardine party. I had been waddling this earth for nearly five decades before I got on the sardine train. And when I did, whew, I mean, just just pop in sardines nutrition into your Google search bar and push the button. You'll see what I'm talking about. Those little babies are gold. And as of right now, they've not been discovered by Instagram so they're still cheap. Nobody on Instagram is doing sardines yet. Which actually brings me to another point that I should have elaborated on a little bit earlier. When I'm talking about my modular pantry and my pantry staples and all of this, 
you have to be ready to pivot. Back in 2020, there was a certain health issue that seemed to be global that I don't think you're allowed to speak about on YouTube, so I'll be vague, but we all know what I'm saying. And we wound up with these supply chain crises and this and that, and then it fed into inflation. And I've got eggs on my list of things that I always keep on hand. I do. At my local Walmart, 60 large eggs currently cost me $9. At a local grocery store, the same amount of eggs cost me 7 Back before this incident, Walmart had them for five eighty-eight. But there was a point. There was a definite point in 2021 and 2022 where a dozen eggs was like 5 or $6. And there was no way. There was no way I was going to spend that much money on eggs. So I had to find something else. I had to find out, find another good source of protein and fat that would help bridge that gap in my cooking. And, you know, there's a certain little tiny fish that fits that bill pretty well. To just saying. Also, if you look up, if you look up pasta puttanesca, which to be YouTube friendly would translate to pasta of the ladies of the evening. If you get my drift, you will see that is made with either anchovies or sardines. And both are great. And both are very inexpensive to prepare using pantry staples. Uh, I guess a lot depends on whether you have access to anchovies or sardines. The anchovies tend to be more expensive and are very salty. Let's just give it up to sardines for being very salty. I mean, to, uh, anchovies for being very salty. The only like tricky ingredient is there is capers. Capers, uh, I like them. So I have no problem buying them. They're two dollars and some odd cents a jar. You don't need many. But if you don't like capers or you don't want to buy them, a little squirt of lemon juice will take their place just fine. Another easy, delicious kind of, ooh, my goodness. And it's so fancy. It's so fancy to tell your, to tell your ducky, oh, we're having pasta puttanesca tonight. I mean, come on. Doesn't that sound like I put a lot of work into this? Honestly, man, anything that, that's Italian, that, you know, has an <laughs> Italian name, it's, it's going to automatically sound you know, fancy, fancy. So I, I just, and, and let me go. Let me go ahead and shout. Oh no, go ahead, go ahead. Mark. I just wanted Sorry. to ask: Have you have you ever told Duck? Have you ever called up Duck one time and be like, "Hey, we're having pasta, Lady of the Night." Well, not in those terms, <laughs> but in the actual YouTube yeah. unfriendly terms. Um, and if so, what was his reaction? The first time that I made it, I said, "Hey, babe, do you want pasta puttanesca?" And he said. I don't know. What's that? And I said, it's the word that starts with a W and continues with an H. It's the Hymns pasta. And he was like, what? There's a special pasta for that? That's a thing? <laughs> how is that a thing? Did they all agree on this? I mean, how does it even work? <laughs> so, you know... Oh. He, he was a little boggled. <laughs> a little boggled. Ooh. Let's just say he thought it was odd to uh, tie pasta to a specific entertainment profession. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Seemed weird to him. But, you know, we got there and he loves it. He loves it. Which is another little thing that I kind of want to bring up. Inside of all of these, these cuisines, particularly cuisines that the average American thinks they know, there's so much more depth. So, oh man, I'm going to sound so arrogant when I say this, but I'm, I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it. When it comes to making uh, Italian food or Mexican food or whatever, I keep saying you work with what you've got. You have what you have. Recipes are not canon. There is a particular way that it's printed in a cookbook. There's a particular way that it's shown on YouTube videos and all of this. But cooking is not a canon thing. You sub things in and out. If you don't have anchovies, you put sardines in your pasta puttanesca. If you don't have capers, you put a little squirt of lemon. If you want to throw some black olives in there, you do that. You do you. And you can adapt recipes. Fancy, fancy recipes. Or regular recipes that are just expensive to fit what you have with experimentation 
little practice. And I, I cannot tell you how much I live on YouTube. But I have learned so much from watching people cook on YouTube. You can absolutely make things your own. Do it with what you've got. Uh, switch out things, skip things, whatever you got to do. Get it to where you you can easily afford it, you can easily prepare it, and your family likes it. That's all that matters. It does not have to be authentic anything. Cooking is art. Caveat, baking is not art. Baking is science. It is specifically chemistry. You can't go willy-nilly swapping out stuff in baking because there are chemical reactions going on there. And you can get in trouble in a hurry trying to make a cake and being like, eh, I, I don't have baking soda. Yeah, I'll skip it. No, 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 no that's not, not, not great. Not a plan. You're making a hockey puck. Let's, let's back that up, you know. But with cooking, at least, you'd have to actually, and I'm sure there are people out there, maybe you know some, Mike, who can get on and tell your viewers about economical baked goods. I am not much of a baker, really. I can tell you this. If you absolutely need a cake in a pinch, you can buy a dollar cake mix and grab pre preferably a yeah depend the flavor depends but get a 12 ounce can of soda and mix it into a cake mix and bake a cake with it you you can absolutely do that i have done that before for budget reasons and for just funsies but not not a joke you can take like a white cake mix and throw a grape soda in it and have a purple cow cake oh. or a uh, or a, a yellow cake mix and throw some seven up in it and have a seven up cake or some chocolate cake mix and uh, dr pepper and you know whatever but that, that that's about as as smart with baking swaps as i am and those are all over pinterest and full disclosure that's where i got it from which pinterest is an untapped source of knowledge if you don't know then you might not it is Hop onto Pinterest and type any food that you can think of in the search bar, and it will find you recipes for it. Purple Man, cow. those Pinterest girlies know their stuff. Yeah, and a purple cow is pretty good. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it is pretty darn good. I, I, I've heard of a poem called that, but I've never heard of a cake. So just kind of a little side story here. I was at work. I used to work. Uh, I used to work at a Wendy's back in the day. I was a grill cook. And usually the first of the month was really... Oh. That was our hell day. That was the day in which we had customer after customer almost nonstop. And so after, you know, usually about maybe 11 or 12 a.m., it finally starts to, to, to taper off. And so it, it was about that time my manager came in and she started reciting this poem. I never saw a purple cow and I never hoped to see one. But I can tell you something anyhow. It's better to see one than to be one. And I just had to, I had to just rub my face and just, I was like, what? Because <laughs> I, I thought I had lost it. I thought I had absolutely lost it. And because it, it was really such a hectic day and I was still fairly new there. So getting adjusted to working in the fast food place, it was, whew. So yeah, I had no idea there was an, an actual dessert called that though. And it sounds absolutely delicious. I don't it's, know too it's much. pretty good. I don't know too much about baking either, but I think I, I I remember reading or being told that baking soda and baking powder are in fact not interchangeable. Is that they true? are not. That is completely true. They they are not. They are two separate things. It has to do with the amount of leavening. Baking soda levels more. No, pardon me. Baking powder levels more leavens. Good grief i can't i can't even talk about baking i've fallen all over <laughs> myself here baking powder has more leavening action that means it makes it fluffier more than baking soda will however baking soda is also a form of salt which brings me to my favorite use for baking soda which i am currently doing as we speak I have some dried pinto beans soaking in water with a spoonful of baking soda. Because if you will put that in there as your beans soak, when you go to cook them the next day, you will make the most tender, creamy, luxurious beans you can imagine. 
Uh, the, the, the mouthfeel on them, oh my God, they are so smooth and so luxurious and unctuous and wonderful. And it, it's just baking soda. Soaking, put a little baking soda in the water is the only trick to that. Absolutely elevates everything. But here's the thing. I didn't know that. I had to find that out from a YouTube girly who was like, hey, yeah, I'm making beans. I'm going to soak them with some baking soda. And I was like, why are you deodorizing them? Do your beans smell? What are you doing over there? I don't know. Changes the texture of them. Ah, wouldn't have known if I hadn't seen that video. Wouldn't have adopted it if I hadn't known that. Don't ever want to not do it. Wonderful, wonderful stuff. So many things are are wonderful that are also, and by the way, baking soda is very inexpensive. But once again, it is sodium bicarbonate. Emphasis on the sodium. It's a form of salt. So keep that in mind if you're using baking soda for whatever purpose that isn't cleaning your kitchen sink. Just know you're adding salt to what you're cooking. Adjust accordingly. You know, it cool that, right? You can look up uh, recipes that don't, like like for Irish soda bread, is based on the leavening in baking soda. But I went through this phase recently. And by recently, I mean hmm, September or October of last year. I decided, you know what? I'm paying too much for bread. I could make bread cheaper than I can buy bread. And that is true. 100% that's true. You can. And I was down with the homemade bread up until about a month ago. And for one thing, I had a very bad period with my uh, fatigue and my pain, and I wasn't really able to do much. I was, I spent, you know this, Mike, I spent like three weeks or so basically just in bed. Just couldn't, couldn't knack it, couldn't deal with it, right? But we're coming up, we're, we're, we're doing a little better now, we're, we're kind of on track. And I told my ducky tonight, next, next grocery list, I'm just going to get you to buy a loaf of bread so I can throw it in the freezer against the day that I need to put a sandwich in your lunch. Because until this heat and this humidity passes, I don't think I got bacon in me. I, I, I just don't know if I can do it. I don't know if I can run an oven for 40 minutes. This heat's unbearable. Just, just not going to do it. And that brings me to this. This is the one thing that I 100% want to drive home to anyone listening. Yes, as many whole foods as you can get. Cabbage, eggs, onions, carrots, potatoes, rice, beans, chickpeas, lentils. As much of that as you can get. Those are your basics, right? But remember, there's something out there called the 80-20 rule. I actually found this. And I'm sure other people know about this and have said this. But I found this from watching, of all things... You, you might not expect how deep my YouTubing goes here, Mike. But there is a bodybuilder by the name of Will Tennyson that I watch. And I am absolutely not a bodybuilder. But he is an affable, likable guy. And he sometimes talks about food that he uses like for his training regimens and things. And whether it's working out or it's his diet or anything else, he always hammers home the idea of the 80-20 rule. What you do today. What you have for dinner tonight doesn't matter over the course of, compared to what you do over the course of a week or a month or a year. So realistically, aim to keep your diet nice and whole, nice and nice and clean, nice and healthy, 80% of the time. And don't even think about the other 20%. Life happens. Things happen. It doesn't work out all the time. So I bring that up because I have what I call honk it mules. There are going to be days, knowing myself, that I am literally not going to be able to make dinner. I'm just not going to be able to get out of the bed. That's facts are facts, right? So I keep a six pack of instant noodles on my shelf. They're terrible for you. They, they, they have no nutritional value. They're awful, but they're there. I also will keep a bag of whatever is on sale. Pizza rolls or fish sticks or something. So that when my my sweet ducky comes home at the end of his work day, there is something he can throw in the air fryer or throw in a pot for two minutes, and we can just call it dinner. That's going to happen. Life is going to happen. It's not going to be perfect. Don't be pedantic. Leave yourself some space and some grace for those nights that things just go wrong. And if you have that, if you have that, if you have got a bag of pizza rolls that you got on sale, and all of my honking stuff comes from being things that are on sale, right? 
or a, a bag of fish sticks, and fish sticks aren't even really that bad for you. But whatever, if you've got something you can toss and just kind of throw and go, that stops you from going through a drive through on your way home because you're too tired and exhausted or whatever to cook, that, that's a win right there. I can't tell you how many pizza rolls I can get for what dinner at McDonald's would cost us right now, which in my area of the country, two people, $20. Damn. For a, for a combo, two combos. Yeah, $20. Do you know how many pizza rolls you can buy for $20? For what, like, for like four bags maybe? Five bags? <sighs> this is kind of funny. So I haven't, like, I don't think I mentioned this, and it's a little relevant to my specific situation. But I am in the deep, deep south. Like, I am in the deep south. Like, I'm at risk for being carried away by gnats. Kind of deep south, right? Now, my little town has one whole stoplight in it. And in a town this small, I am fortunate there is a local grocery store. It is not much. And a Dollar Tree and a Family Dollar. So I've got three grocery shopping options. None of them are great. But... Worst case scenario, I could get food from these places, right? However, however, my ducky works in a town 50 miles away. So poor guy has a 100-mile round-trip commute every single day of his life, right? But on his way back, he passes through a larger city. I say city, but I'm talking about <laughs> if my one stoplight's a town, then this is a city, okay? I mean, 30,000 people maybe, that, that, that sized? But this place sports a Walmart. <clears throat> as well as a uh, a Win Dixie and a local grocery store, local regional chain, and that regional chain has a house brand, which you will find at a lot of the independent grocers. Not all of them, but a lot of them will have a brand called Best Choice, and I like most Best Choice products better than I like national ones. And I will go on about this forever when it comes to best choice pizza rolls. They are significantly less expensive than the national brand. And the difference between them is the national brand puffs up a lot. Like it gets airy in the middle. Kind of, they kind of look a little fat when you cook them. These do not. They're a little flatter when you bring them out. But the taste on them is definitely superior. And last time around, they were on sale. Got them 40 of them for 250 So now, what's the better better shout here i've got a bag of pizza rolls that he can throw in the air fryer for 12 minutes and we can have dinner or he stops at mcdonald's and pays 20 dollars I mean, think of just just think about it but 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 plan but not just think about it like ooh, look how how right she is that's one that's one correct goose i'm seeing over there but no i mean like literally think about it if you plan for days that are going to go wrong and they will and that's the 80 20 rule you're okay everything's fine you can go home and just pop a bag of pizza rolls that were on sale in the air fryer or in the oven. And yes, it's processed food. And no, it's not the greatest choice. But it's not going to kill you and your belly will be full and you can go to bed with minimal effort. This is back to what I was saying about keeping in mind it's not just cost. That's a huge factor. And it's not just nutrition. That's another huge factor. But variety which is why I have my three seasoning palettes that I keep very deep, and um, time, convenience. That is a definite factor. And let's just all admit it. Our lives are not that, that seamless. I, I don't know. My, my life isn't seamless. It's, it's a mess. Good Lord, I'm a hot mess. So I always have my little buffers. Hey, I hear that chuckle. You a mess over there too, Mike? You, you know, I think, I think I told you this before. I think I, you know, there's this meme that perfectly describes my life. You know, it's the meme. It says the Loris is restaurant, the Loris restaurant, and yes, know. yes, <laughs> that's my life. You know, my life is a mess, but somehow it works itself out in the end. So, <laughs> yeah, where it just says restaurant, <laughs> look at the things so, around. So the dark pop, side. Make sure says you pop that Dolores up. Loris, so. and yep, and uh, the light <laughs> side says restaurant. So. It all works itself out in the end. I'll I'll post the meme here so you guys can check it out. Yeah, definitely do that. How how difficult was it for you to adopt the eighty twenty rule? Hard, hard. And I am going to throw a little meme in into our Discord here that you can show the people that entirely encapsulates it. I am riddled with self doubt. It is hard. It is so hard. 
when you are trying, especially when you are very, very poor, you are low income. And I cannot state this enough. I, okay, a little more backstory that I didn't necessarily give. But from my birth until I was 32 years old, I was solidly middle class, bordering on upper middle class. Things went sideways, and I found myself mired in rural poverty. Deep rural poverty. A hot dog a day kind of rural poverty. Things happen. Poor people are not bad people. They're not poor because they made terrible life choices. They're not poor because they don't try to manage their money. Things happen, and it can happen to anyone. It happened to me. And if you look at what happened in the 1920s in the Great Depression, you could be a, a millionaire industrialist and it could happen to you. It happens. Things can go wrong. But poor, being poor in America comes with a stigma, with a shame. You feel bad about yourself. If you are poor, it's because you're not enough. You're not worthy enough. You're not good enough. You're not working hard enough. It's a meritocracy, right? If you just worked harder, you'd be rich, right? No. No, this is not a meritocracy at all. Meritocracy is a great idea, but it is not what is happening here. It is hard to shake those feelings of inadequacy and shame. How did I get here? What did I do wrong? I had to have done something wrong. Why Why do I not have a, an overflowing pantry? Why don't I have ICE berries? Why can't I do these things? And that just leads to this internal spiral of self-doubt, self-loathing, self-deprecation. And I have struggled with that since I got here to the Deep South. Back in the year of our Lord, 2003. That's been my whole struggle bus there. Poverty and doubt. So much shame and doubt about my status. I didn't used to be poor. Why am I poor now? What have I done wrong? What did I do to deserve this? It can happen to anyone. Anyone at all. Have, have a bad medical emergency that your insurance doesn't cover and talk to me about it in six months. Tell me how you're middle class now. You won't be. You'll be bankrupt. That's that, that's how, how life works, right? And it is very hard to break away from the unspoken narrative that poor people are lazy people. Poor people are just not trying. If they only applied themselves, if they were only smarter, they must be stupid or they wouldn't be there. That is such a stigma in this country. And I am not lazy and I am not stupid. But nevertheless, here I am. So what am I going to do about it? Well, for the longest time, I felt guilt and shame and, and self-pity and desperation and all of these things. Now I am at a point that I am saying to myself, you know what? I am a survivor. I have done more in my life than people with millions of dollars will ever do. More of substance, more of value. And I am good. I am strong and I am proud of myself. So I live in a little sardine can. I've got, I'm rocking one whole bedroom in this crib up here. Oh yeah, I'm living the life, right? But I am feeding my husband and myself on a shoestring budget. And I'm feeding us good food. And I'm feeding us quality food. And I'm putting some variety in there. And I'm putting some love into what I make. And I'm fighting with my chronic pain and my fatigue. And I also, fun fact have been diagnosed with and taken medication for depression and generalized anxiety disorder. I am on an uphill battle, but gosh darn it, I am doing pretty darn good. And boy, how it is. It's hard. It's hard to remember that. And that's how I really value the 80-20 rule. As long as I am doing okay, I'm doing the best I have with what I've got, and I'm hitting the mark 80% of the time, then the rest of the time, to heck with it. I I deserve not to feel pressure on those days that my pain is too bad for me to move. I, I, I don't deserve to feel guilty about that. I deserve to have those stupid pizza rolls in my freezer. And I deserve to be able to just rest on my heating pad until my ducky gets home. And if that's not Instagrammable, if that's not wholesome enough, if that's not this or that enough, well, those are all external voices talking to me. I say they're good enough. He says they're good enough. 
we're having pizza rolls. End of story. Sorry for the tirade. I'm just really passionate on this. Well, the important thing is that you're happy. You're at a place in your life where you feel happy, where you feel peace. And you feel that most importantly, you feel like you have control over your life. You know, I, I cannot stress I enough do. just how important the idea of feeling like you're in control of your own your own life, your own destiny. You know, the fact that... It, it, it is. And you know what? If you've ever been really hungry, like like I have been, right? Like super hungry, right? You do not know how much peace it gives me. I have a five-gallon um, food-safe container that I store my rice in. I buy my rice 20 pounds at a time. It will hold about 35 pounds. When I get to about the halfway mark... We get another bag of rice. That boy, that, that thing does not get below half. And I store my beans, eight pounds at a time. When I get down to about two pounds of beans, we buy more beans. And no matter how bad my things are going, my situation is, I can go look at that rice and look at those beans and be like, yeah, it could be a lot worse. This is okay. This is fine. And that peace that comes with that allows you to strategically plan your budget. You, I think I told you this one time in a group call, but if you've got rice and beans and maybe some applesauce and some sauerkraut and some onions or whatever, you got a little produce going on, you got a little, you know, your your carb and your, your protein sorted out, then the grocery stores don't have any real hold on you. You're no longer that weird kid in the fedora sitting by himself at lunch. You're now the pretty girl a week ahead of homecoming. Because if they don't have what you want, you can just not. You can like literally just not know your sales aren't good enough. Screw you, grocery store. And just not. You you have that power. And it's it feels so good to have that kind of power. It does. You you don't have to take whatever is on offer at the time because you've got no choice. You do have a choice. And you can choose to buy the things that fit your budget. And just save that week's grocery money. Maybe next week they'll get their act together and run like chicken thigh quarters for 49 cents a pound in a 10 pound bag. Now that's not too bad. I can get behind that. But I, I don't let myself feel out of control anymore because I've got my rice and my beans. Let me tell you a little, uh, boy, howdy, this is some deep goose lore. But I am from San Antonio, by the way. San Antonio is, has a very large Hispanic population. About half, to tell you the truth, about 50% Hispanic. And a lot of those people are first generation uh, Mexican Americans or, you know, or immigrants to the United States from Mexico. And there is a, ages ago when I was still in San Antonio, I heard people talk about this. There was that kind of a tradition where when a man and a woman would get married, the father of the bride would go to their new home and plant an avocado tree in their backyard. And then he would look at the husband and say, as long as you have rice and beans, your family will never go hungry. Because that avocado is a perfect source of healthy fat. Now you've got protein, carbs, and fats. Your macros are done. You're good to go. That's the kind of energy I try to give myself. I've got rice. I've got beans. There's some eggs in the fridge, which are a great source of protein and healthy fat. I've got a little olive oil on hand. I'm good. I, I don't need y'all. You need me. I don't need you. And that sounds sassy and sounds kind of obnoxious, but it, it feels good to be there. It feels good to be the pretty girl instead of the nerd in the corner. I want to ask, you know, because we're getting, we're kind of drawing close to the end here. If you could go back and do anything different, is there anything that you would choose to have done different in your journey to where you are now? Yes. Yes. I would have leveraged the power of the internet a lot more than I did. And here's one of the things I'm going to tell you. If you're listening to this right now, then you have some sort of internet access. Maybe you've got a laptop, maybe you got a desktop, maybe you got a, a phone or whatever, right? Just have to figure out the questions to ask and the easiest way to do this is to type in broad things and listen to people talk until something clicks. One thing that I did not ever think to do until a few years ago when I got really serious about this budgeting thing. That little grocery store I was telling you about that that goes through that has my best choice pizza rolls, well they're big enough to have online advertising. So I can sit in my bedroom and look at their ad on Wednesday morning and plan my grocery list according to what they have on sale. And if it's not on sale, I've got rice and beans. I probably don't want it. Never occurred to me. Never actually occurred to me that I could do that. But I can. The depth of a platform like YouTube is incredible. You can find people doing budget recipes 
for almost every tier. You can get extreme budget recipes. You can get family budget recipes. Let me give a, a, a little tip here. And, this, and, the, and the reason I say this, I do not ascribe to this at all. Myself, personally, I don't have a need to. But there are plenty of people in this world who are living in food deserts where they just don't have a grocery store. And there is a channel floating around with a very charming young lady uh, as the host of it. And she has a channel called Dollar Tree Dinners. And everything on her channel is her making recipes from items that she has purchased at a Dollar Tree. If that's all you've got, if that's what you're working with, she's got some pretty good ideas. She's creative with what she's doing. That's great. If you are interested in shopping <clears throat> with the economy of scale thing, kind of the way I do, there is a woman out there with a channel called Frugal Fit Mom. Now, she's not as frugal as I am, but on the other hand, she's got a family of six, you know, so a lot more people. But she's got a ton of videos on her channel about shopping sales, shopping clearance, recipes that will feed a large family. I don't have to worry about a large family, but loads of people do. And I still watch her, and sometimes I get ideas. There's a... Uh, a little old lady in Tennessee who goes by Southern Frugal Mama. And she's a down-home country girl like you would kind of expect with a husband and three kids. And she does budget challenge videos all the time. And if you want to know how to make Southern-style soup beans, she's she's got the recipe for you. And she, she can show you how to make some homemade biscuits. She can do that. All of those resources are out there. All of those things are available, but you have to find them. And it is threading a needle on the internet to find good quality content and avoid the toxic content. I've got no interest in seeing flashy people living flashy lifestyles that I will never obtain and telling me that I should probably check to make sure I've got enough nutritional yeast and textured Pro vegetable protein in my pantry to make their dinners. I have n no interest in that. If I had money, maybe I would have an interest in that, but I don't, and so I skip on those things. But you can learn so much from the internet. You just have to curate what you consume. Let in the positive and block out those things that make you feel inadequate and foolish and hopeless. If you can find someone that speaking to you, that's giving you ideas, that's giving you something to work with, they're valuable. If they're making you feel envious, you should probably just not view that content anymore. It's not good for you to be envious. I think that's a great point to bring up, Bestie. You know, one thing I like, to, I like to remind people of over and over again, is we live in the information age. And so you're not, a, you're not alone here. If you're going through something or if you need information about something, Chances are it's already been discussed. It's already been researched. You know, there's loads of content out there. You know, you have to search for it. You have to sometimes separate the wheat from the shaft. But it's there. And so take advantage and stand on the shoulder of giants. Also, I would like to recommend, you know, if you have anybody, if you have any older people in your area or in, in your family, in your social network, sit down and talk to them. Sit down and talk to them. Have a conversation. Draw on that wisdom. I don't think that we... I think, unfortunately, we're a little too late in the game to take advantage of this situation. Had had I been old enough, you know, I would have loved to have sat down and talked with some people who lived through the Great Depression, for example. Say, hey, okay, so you didn't have a lot of money then. So how did you handle that situation? What kind of foods did you eat? Um, what did you what did you what did you do when you couldn't go out and and say and go you know drop a lot of money on dinner for example or what would you do in that situation um, unfortunately you know that time has passed they can't do that anymore but there's still older people there's still older generations there now, not every old person will be knowledgeable about something um, or not uh, you know not all not all all experiences are equal but again, you know, it's separating the wheat from the chaff, the wheat from the chaff. Um, so just try to keep that in mind. Stand on the shoulders of giants. You know, take advantage of the information at your disposal 
and the wisdom at your disposal and use it to your advantage, as my bestie has pointed out. Yes, that, and that is exactly what I did. I didn't come to any of these things in a vacuum. I didn't understand how I could incorporate whole foods and a a largely plant-based diet, which again, it's not intentional. It's because meat prices are just too damn high. You know, how I could, could feed my family in that way without having found inspiration. These ladies were either, these people, and I say ladies, it's, it's mostly women who do this content on YouTube, by the way. But there are, there are, there are some fellows out there. And uh, as, as I noted before, I, I dig, or I cast my net wide. That's how I happened to follow Will Tennyson, the bodybuilder, for crying out loud. I mean, I, I look for it where I can. I take what I can of value and try to internalize it. And I go forward from there. By the same token, I am also subscribed to uh, a fellow named Jason Stevenson, who is an Australian guy who does guided meditations, and when the whole world is just falling to honk in a handbasket, I sometimes just listen to him guide me through a meditation to calm my doggone self. Sometimes you got to take a minute, guy, you know? So what can I say? Sometimes you need a minute. That helps. That truly helps. I just want to point out, wow, while we're talking about YouTube and stuff, if you think my bestie has a great deal of knowledge about food and cooking and, and budget meal planning, you should listen to her honk about YouTube. I have never met another person with as much knowledge of YouTube lore or YouTube history as this goose right here. So one day maybe I would have to <laughs> love to have her back on to talk about some YouTube-related stuff. Well, well, we, we could. Um, I, I don't know if there's such a thing as having a, a doctorate in YouTubeology. But I have found that if you can avoid the content that is toxic to you, that makes you feel bad, that makes you feel, and, and you know, it, it's okay to feel a little bad sometimes. It's okay to watch someone make a great piece of art, for example. There, there's a whole section of art YouTube. You can watch someone do it and go, man, I sure wish I could do that. that, that that's fine. But if you find something that's making you feel really negative about yourself or, and my biggest ray of flag is making you feel envious, you want to stay away from that. But good heavens, it is an entire universe out there. And you got to kind of curate yourself now. You know, check yourself before you wreck yourself and all of that kind of a thing. There's some stuff on YouTube that they ain't got any business being there. To tell you the truth, there are some dark, terrible things on there. But let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. There is plenty of really good content that will help you. Here, here is one example. If you want to know how to do almost anything, if you want to know how to change the spark plugs in your 98 Toyota Corolla, or if you want to know how to crochet a pair of slippers, you can find that out on YouTube. There's a tutorial out there for it. One thing I like to tell people, I like to tell people, think of YouTube as like a microcosm. I know it sounds crazy to think of YouTube as being small, but think of YouTube as like a microcosm of the internet as a whole. Yeah. Whatever you can find on the internet, you can find it on YouTube. You know, Maybe it's in a very dark corner, very, very deep depth, but you can find it on there. They, they, you know, and it, yeah, just like sure with can. the internet, you have the good aspects, you have the bad aspects, you'll find it on YouTube. And that's one of the things I think that makes YouTube so endearing, is that, you know, pretty much anything and everything can be there. But almost, almost. Yeah, say. yeah, 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 it, it is, well, I mean, not even just almost, I mean, the way the TOS is written, it's kind of weird, I mean... Technically, you can't get straight-up pornography, but there are people skirting that by tagging their videos as nude yoga. Oh. A Mudahar from uh, Some Ordinary Gamers went on a whole rant about that, and he's not wrong. So, <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, and, and Mudahar from Some Ordinary Gamers, I do uh, watch yeah, semi-regularly. I like his podcast, Some Ordinary Podcast. I listen to that almost every episode. Love it. Big fan of Nux, Nux Taku. Shout out to Nux, my man. 
<laughs> but anyway, um, you know, it, it's funny too what you become or what you find. You might have an interest in something that you didn't know you had an interest in. Like, I didn't realize how much I liked anime until I listened to Nux Taku for a while. And then I started getting into anime. And boy, howdy, did that make my duck, who is an anime guy, super happy. Like, uh, two weeks ago, I sat down and said, my guy, I've been watching this this anime on Crunchyroll, which is one of the, and that's another budgeting tip, be careful with your subscriptions. You don't need Hulu and HBO Max and Netflix and, and, and. Like, pick one and watch it for a while and then drop it and pick up another if that's your primary form of entertainment. But the one we agree on, YouTube is my primary form of entertainment, but the one we agree on is Crunchyroll. So I kept that on there, and one night, you know, he came up from work, and I was like, babe, I want you to get caught up on Demon Hunter with me. The third season just dropped, and Nux put out this amazing video, and I watched Demon Hunter, and it's great. It's, it's so amazing. And you have never seen a happier little chubba duck in your life. He was like, wait, you want to watch anime every night for the next week? And I was like, yep. <laughs> That's that. That's what I want to do. And he was like, oh, "Oh my gosh, this is the greatest thing ever." <laughs> well, uh, what can I tell you, my duck? Bring home some popcorn because we in anime mode now, boy. And yes, by the way, Demon Hunter is brilliant, and Nux loves it, and I love it, and now so does my duck. Shout out to Demon Hunter. <laughs> Whatever. But I mean, you you, you might not know. Uh, I am very open minded when it comes to the arts. I like all genres of music. I like all genres of film. I, I, I'm a huge... I, I majored in English literature, so I'm like a super hyper nerd. But I love 19th century poetry. I, I just love art in general. And you can make the argument that as far as animation goes, uh, Demon Hunter is stellar for its artistic value. It is incredibly artistic. It is beautiful. It is a gorgeous, gorgeous thing to watch. So what can I say? Would I have known that if I hadn't been on YouTube? No, probably not. But here we are. And that led to a great week with my husband of every night, him rushing home from work like, oh, can we watch some anime now? <laughs> yes, baby, let's eat dinner in, in bed and watch the anime. It's interesting that you bring up, you know, streaming services and such, <laughs> because if it wasn't for YouTube, I never would have discovered the idea of cord cutting and falling down this rabbit hole of cord cutting and, you know, streaming services and free streaming services and such. And so it's really piqued my interest because I don't watch a lot of TV. Like, I, I maybe, like, once once a week, every Friday night, I'll, I'll, I'll settle down. I'll watch the latest episodes of some of my favorite shows, like Family Guy, South Park, Beavis and Butthead. I'll watch an episode of an anime I'm currently watching as well. And that'll be that. Now, sometimes I also watch a movie on the weekend, but that's a bit more rare. Or there'll be a docu se- a series I like to watch. But I'm not a very big uh, I'm not a very big consumer of a lot of traditional media simply because I, I don't have the time. You know, the content creation takes up most of my time. I also I, sp- I consume a lot of YouTube content as well. But if it wasn't for YouTube, I never would have found that out. And even though it's not something that I particularly, I, I particularly partake in myself at the moment, it's an idea I find to be extremely interesting. But if it wasn't for YouTube, I never would have found fell down that rabbit hole. And as a result, sometime in the future, uh, one of my planned videos, nothing promised, but one of my planned videos is going to be on cord cutting and, you know, free streaming, legally free streaming services that are available. So, but if it wasn't for YouTube, I never would have came to that conclusion. So, YouTube is a great source to introduce people to different topics. And that's the power of the internet for you, because if you hadn't gone that down that rabbit hole, you wouldn't have honked about it in our little group chat that we're in, and my ducky wouldn't have tried out the free streaming service Tubi that he is now obsessed with. He loves it. He loves Tubi. And so now, instead of him switching back and forth between Hulu and Netflix, we can cut both of those paid services off and just probably do YouTube, Crunchyroll, and Tubi. And by the way, Crunchyroll is like the cheapest. I think they're like eight ninety nine a month or something. But yeah, you know, I was just, just saying that he loves Tubi, which is a free internet streaming service, and you're talking about that cord cutting 
got him to look into it. And now we can probably do away. We, we had this, uh, okay, here's another like full disclosure thing. And this is one of the reasons that I'm happy. Regardless of how poor I am, regardless of how bad my physical health may be, regardless of my struggles with anxiety and this and that, I have a quality human in my life. Ducky and I are like beyond soulmates. We are very close to each other. And I hope that everyone out there has someone or find someone that is in, as important to them as he is to me. But we will talk for hours. Like this is a, one of the biggest, honestly, one of the biggest problems that we have, and it's a great problem to have, is that we will leave laundry unwashed or dishes undone until way too late in the evening. And then we're rushing around like crazy people trying to get everything done because even 12 years into our marriage, we can sit down and start talking and just not stop for four hours. And so we were on this this thing the other night about why I prefer YouTube to Netflix and to you know, Hulu and HBO Max and all of that. And it is because I feel, and this is just me, this is just like my personal opinion. I could be way off base here. And I'm sure there'll be a lot of people who have other opinions. But to me, it feels like back in the 80s and the 90s and things, when people were pitching TV shows or pitching movies to studios, it was like a team of people that made this thing and then they shopped it around, fingers crossed, please let someone pick this up. This is the art I made and I want to show my art to the world. Now, it feels like Netflix and Hulu and all those things just have a a herd of writers just sitting around that they employ and they're just like hey guys we need a fantasy series going on and we need a sci-fi series going on and you you over there do something funny and and it doesn't it doesn't feel as artistic as it used to, or as passionate as it used to. And YouTube, for all of its warts and all of its bumps and all of its little stray hairs and awkward places, does have a lot of authenticity and a lot of heart to it. And I don't know, I, I just feel that. So we divide up kind of how much money we spend on entertainment in a month. And the one place that we agree, I, I am willing to concede, 100% willing to concede, that he can have his Hulu or whatever or his Netflix or whatever. The only thing that I want is for us to have, we, we subscribe to YouTube premium. Okay. Sounds a little shameful family plan, $30 a month, but I get more than $30 a month of entertainment out of it and knowledge, you know, I get knowledge out of it. And, um, uh, that lets me support my favorite creators at a higher tier than watching their ads does it's not only the ads that bother me it's, it's that I, I want to support independent creators with my view at a higher rate than just the ad run and i'm poor and i'm over here trying to support the arts what do i know maybe i'm weird but i just i feel like i get so much value out of it and i don't think 30 dollars a month for two people to have access to unlimited entertainment is that bad of a buy i don't feel like that's a bad buy at all so we do that, and now maybe we can get rid of those silly Netflix things, and he'll just watch Tubi. <laughs> Who knows? Say one thing I want to point out before we move on is that you know Tubi, Tubi isn't the only one. There are lots of other free, legally free streaming services out there as well, um, like Philo, for example, or Philo, Philo. And I, I'll shoot you some more uh, later when this conversation is over with. But there are, there are a lot more. Out yeah, yes, please do. Now, a lot please, of them please do because my share. duck. Oh no, I just say please do because my duck will absolutely look into those. He is he is far more into uh, would you call it like mainstream? Well, no, that's not mainstream media has this association with like the news to it. But he's like way more into corporate or network like films and entertainment and things like that than i would ever be yeah he like the thing on tubi he found this old series that he used to watch when he was a kid called merlin and he's just been like binging this thing because as a child he loved it and it does not even exist anywhere else and there there's some like old movies i think he watched something called um 
It's a very early Peter Dinklage movie, the guy from Game of Thrones, but it's called like Super Badass Heroes or something like that. Anyway, anyway, he, he loves that kind of a thing. I, I don't watch a lot of that myself, but he will love to have more options to look at. So by all means, DM me some links that I can give to him or actually DM them to him directly. He'll be like super into it. Yeah, just DM him directly so that he can check those out because he loves that kind of entertainment. Uh, just kind of keep in mind that uh, you'll find a lot of the same content on, on across these pre -stream, legally free streaming services. However, they'll also have some unique content as well. And they also tend to shuffle out a lot as well. So what's here today may, may or may not be there tomorrow or may not be necessarily be there in a month. And so you'll see a lot of shows and movies and other content that's kind of cycle through as well. But that's, but yeah, that's really kind of it um, here for this portion. Um, so do you have anything you want to add before we move into the Q&A section? Um, no, I would just like to say that as you already know, I love you and I want only the best for you. And I really want the best for this series you are doing. If my little honking and flapping here has done one person out there any good, I am delighted for that and for the opportunity to put it on the internet where it can be found by someone looking for this exact kind of content. And I am very much looking forward to you continuing this series because I personally know if you can find anybody out there who has like fitness and uh, mobility tips for people with chronic pain or older people or maybe like obese people or whatever, I would be all into that. And I would certainly be interested in anybody with any organizational tips because I think I mentioned this before, but I am a hot mess. And if you saw what my <laughs> what my drawers look like in my bedroom, you would probably not want to be seen with me in public. Oh, good Lord. Everything's such a mess. <laughs> if so close, it's okay in my book. So I would love, I would love to see more content in this series. And I think it's going to be super helpful for loads of people. And that's kind of, that's, that's the plan. That's the plan. And I look forward to uh, bringing more of it, you know, both talking to experts like such as yourself and subjects and also, you know, doing research on my own, like uh, talking about, you know, how and where to play games for free or how to find uh, legally free uh, games to play or legally free streaming services. Something I look forward to it because I feel like, you know, I feel like, you know, with a platform that there comes a certain responsibility to it. You know, I feel like it would be a damn shame if, you know, if in addition to doing my normal content, trying to entertain people, um, what have you, trying to tell, trying to show people my artistic vision, in addition to doing that stuff, you know, I think it would be a damn shame if I didn't try to use, you know, you know, what platform I have to try to help improve people's lives. So that's a very big thing for me. And that's something I hope to do. Um, and you've helped me today. You've helped, yeah. me. you've helped me do that. So uh, thank you very much, Bestie, for that. Well, I, I, I hope I did. I feel like I rambled and was all over the place, but that my life is all over the place. I am a ramble. But to your point, I believe that there was uh, Bob Marley. Didn't he famously say, one world, one love? Absolutely. Yeah, Maybe we should remember that. Now let's move on to our Q and A section. So, uh, so here, Bestie, we have a series of questions that were asked from our followers across various social media platforms. And our first question okay, okay. comes from at Frillho on Twitter, and they write, "That's such a cool idea. I love it." They're referring to uh, this. This episode of Coffee with Big Mike. I'm terrible at planning awesome. meals. Buying in bulk doesn't always work when there's just two of us in the household. And we have a limited freezer space. I love some tips for easy office lunches with minimal prep time. Oh my gosh, you are right in my alley. I also live in a small space. I like love my sardine can, but there's not a lot of room here. And I also don't have a lot of freezer space and a two-person household. So you are right there for me. Let, let me tell you. I would do bowls. Just, just think bowls, right? So you cook yourself up a big old pot of rice. Now, whether you're doing this in a rice cooker or an Instapot or a pot on your stove, 
Rice is going to take you, let's estimate 20 minutes, right? But it doesn't matter. As long as you've got the volume capacity in your cooking vessel of choice, a cup of rice or a pound of rice is still 20 minutes. I would cook up rice. I would put it in my fridge. And uh, what I didn't think I was going to use in the week, I would put in my freezer. Because rice freezes beautifully, if you did not know. And then I would make bowls. Here's the kind of bowls I would make. I would get myself some beans and some salsa and some fresh veggies. And I would make a burrito bowl. I would also get myself some chickpeas and some soy sauce and maybe a pinch of ginger and some more fresh veggies and make myself an Asian-style bowl. I would take my beans again and I would add some Cajun seasoning or Tony Catchery's um, Creole, Creole seasoning, seasoning uh, Yep, with some sautéed onion and bell peppers and make myself a Cajun rice and beans bowl. I would make myself some lentils with a can of tomato sauce and some ginger and some curry powder, and I would make a curry bowl. Extra bonus points if you got some roasted uh, peppers, I mean, peppers, good grief, roasted potatoes on hand and some peas. Uh, pea and pepper curry is a, a big thing. It's, it's a big recipe. Look them up. They're great. Swap them out, whatever. And lastly, but probably not leastly, I would use my rice and my lentils, pre-cooked lentils, and literally stir them into a can of sloppy joe sauce because lentils make the greatest sloppy joes. And I'd have sloppy joe sauce and lentils over rice. Those would be my tips for making plant-based, easy, quick, it's all based on the rice. Cook it up all once on your day off. Portion them out. Good to go. Those would be what I would make. I just want to say uh, thank you so much for your question, Frilho. An awesome name, by the way. For those who don't know, Frilho is a play, is a, is a Simpsons reference to Frill House. Really awesome account. Please give him a follow if you're on Twitter. Now, our next question comes from Nimblewill. At Nimblewill on Counter Social. And they write, Meals that require little to no meat. Using what's on hand when you're low on fresh fruit and vegetables. Okay, so if I'm low on fresh fruit and vegetables, I actually, I've got you here. If we want to go with no meat whatsoever and we don't have any fresh vegetables, one of the things I always keep, just always do, is sauerkraut. I keep that in my fridge, right? So I would get for my protein either beans or lentils, either one, cooked up. I would roast myself some potatoes and onions. I would toss myself some uh, sauerkraut on top of them, as well as some cooked and seasoned beans or lentils, and I would probably season them with something kind of umami-ish, like a soy sauce or Worcestershire sauce, and do a... Th th think of the, the potato kraut and onion kielbasa sort of sheet pan dinners. But instead of the kielbasa, I would just put in beans or lentils. And thank you for your question at Nimble Will. At Mims on Counter Social writes, Veg recipes using Beyond Meat products or the like, please. Okay. Full disclosure. I am in the tiniest of tiny towns. And the town where I buy my groceries about 25 miles away the Walmart there is the only place that carries Beyond Meat. It's very hit and miss, and it is not inexpensive. So this is not anything that is in with it, my wheelhouse. I can tell you this. I like the taste of Beyond Meat. My preference on those rare occasions that I'm going to spring for fast food, my preference is like the uh, Impossible Burger at Burger King as opposed to the, the regular ones. I, I, I do love the way plant based meat taste these days. It's become incredible. But I just don't cook with it because I can't access it and I can't afford it. However, I'm going to throw a, a link here at Big Mike for him to put in the in the video. And someone here has got 20-minute plant-based lunches that will give you a more informed idea than what I could possibly do. And thank you very much for your question at MEMS. Now, our final question comes from 
Inzi, Inzi who? Inzi Zhu on Counter Social, and they ask how to reduce food loss, which is reaching horrifying levels. You are not kidding. Oh my gosh, I hate wasting food here so much. And I'll tell you something. Every cuisine, including like your basic American cuisine, Southern cuisine, every cuisine has something in it that is a kitchen sink recipe. And what I mean by that is like the, like the American version of a kitchen sink recipe is you save as you're going through your, your week. You save your leftover green beans from one meal. You got a couple of potatoes from another meal. You just save them all up. And you chunk them in a pot with some chicken broth and make soup. Or veggie broth, you know, whatever your preference is there. And make soup. That That is one thing. But other cultures have different kitchen sink meals. Uh, fried rice is a kitchen sink meal. You put whatever you've got into it and fry it up and add an egg and some soy sauce and you're good to go, right? So I would do soups, stews, things in like casserole kinds of dishes with my leftovers. And this is also not only leftover food that you've pre-cooked, but this is a great way, especially with soups. I love soup. I just, I, I adore it because it is, it's almost a feeling more than it's a recipe. But I talked earlier about getting the Noor chicken powders and stuff like that. If you want to make your own broth, that's great. I do that too. I'm in full disclosure. I like to keep my vegetable peels and scraps and stuff and make vegetable broth on my stove. Um, and then freeze it in ice trays and put it in a Ziploc bag and pull it out to use when I want it. But get yourself some flavorful blur broth. However you arrive at that, you arrive at that. And a day or two before you're going to go grocery shopping, just pull everything out that's starting to go sketchy. If you've got a wrinkly bell pepper a kind of flabby carrot, a flaccid celery stalk or two, a potato that's looking at you with its eyes, just cut those off and toss it in the pot. Absolutely. Clean out your fridge once every week or two, right before grocery day, and make a big old pot of soup. And with a good piece of crusty bread, that's a darn good meal. Just remember, do you want to use your seasonings? And you want to tailor it to your family's palate. And you want to cook it with pride and with love. This isn't trash you're putting in a pot that you otherwise would discard. This is you making the most out of what you have and making a delicious meal for your family because you care about them. Right, and that's going to do it for our Q&A session. Thank you so much, NZ Zhu. Please forgive me for mispronouncing your name. Thank you so much for your questions, and thank everybody for their questions. We really do appreciate them. Now, I want to turn it over to you, Bestie. Do you have any questions for me? Yes, I do, Mike. What have you got in this series that I, I can look forward to next, and what you got coming down the pipeline for me? Because it's for me, specifically. You make your content for me. I already know that. Yeah, I, I do, in fact, make my content. Yeah. Useful <laughs> <Just behind>. But... Uh, <laughs> But I would say <laughs> exactly that is the whole point. Well, two things. Well, two things here. Well, in regards to uh, in regards to this series specifically, uh, coffee with Big Mike, I do have some pretty uh, some pretty big content coming up. Um, I do have some pretty exclusive content coming up as well. However, in regards to this initiative, the Big Mike Libin Initiative. This is actually my first video in that, and this, uh, this, this is going to be an initiative that's going to exp uh, span across all my content, or most of my content types on my channel. Um, and it, the, the driving philosophy behind it is to share knowledge and resources to help us, you know, you know, to live better lives, to help better educate us. Like, you know, the whole purpose of this video is to help us to be able to be able to eat healthy and affordable. So I do have more content coming in regards to that that are in various stages of production. But I also, even though this is the first video, um, however, I also have three earlier videos I'm adding to this as well. My uh, one of the previous episodes I did, or the last, uh, or one, I'm sorry, one of the previous episodes I did, I did an episode with our friend Kit, who is the admin for Travel with Confidence. And so that episode was about traveling, travel advice, travel experience, 
you know, travel stories. Many people dream of traveling, you know, traveling you know, around the country, around the globe. And so many people may find that educational. But I made that interview before I had the idea for this initiative. So that 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 episode wasn't made with the intent of this. It's just luckily, just kind of lucked up, and it happens to have fit with that theme. Now, also, I have some previous content as well. Uh, my Freeloader Gaming series. The very first video I ever made, I did a an, epi- an episode of Freeloader Gaming where I... Well, first off, Freeloader Gaming is a series where I show you how and where to play games legally for free. And the very first episode I did was for a site or for a platform called Antstream. And that's included. And also, uh, my big passion video last year for my channel was my Sage. My Freeloader Gaming Sage video. And both of those videos you know, show you different places. Uh, two very different places and featuring two... Uh, at least two very different styles of games that you can play legally for free. So that content is already available. And I got some more in the works, including what I'm hoping is going to be my big passion video for this uh, for this season of my content as well. Um, and you can expect more and more. Also, I have some content. I have some content, you know, in the works. I'm, I'm talking to some people behind the scenes. So, some people I'm friends with or close to in real life. And also... Some connections I made throughout my, you know, 35 plus years, almost 36 plus years of being alive, trying to uh, uh, contacts I made, uh, contacts I made during that time to with people who are knowledge knowledgeable in various you know fields. I feel like it's useful to to know. So I have some solo content coming. Um, I have some content on the way, uh, and this initiative is also coming with other people as well so stay tuned for that and i'm very much excited for that now outside of my big night my outside of my big mike living initiative i also have content i have more gaming content coming i have more well i'm not sure when this video is actually going to come out but i I, you know i'm steadily following uh, the david grush situation um you know the the con the congressional investigation the congressional hearing on the ufo uap um no uh, happenings as well and i plan on to continue you know following that and to branch out and to deal with related subjects as well once the david grush story finally finally settles down and in addition to that i plan to just continue covering you know covering you know in addition to games covering some more series uh, some tv series i like and really just about anything i like anything i want to man uh or bestie i should say I I never want to put myself in a box when it comes to my content. I, I never want to say, okay, I'm only gonna make this type of content or that type of content. I want to I want to I want to always have myself in a situation to where if I wake up one day and I want to make this type of content, I, I can do that. And if I wake up one day and I say, hey, you know what? I don't want to do that anymore. I want to do something different. I can do that as well. Um, but I. I don't mind. I don't mind making any kind of content as long as I'm passionate about what I'm doing. But I never want to be known as, oh, this is this is this guy, or he's this type of video guy, or he's that type of video guy. I want I want my content to transcend. Um, so, in short, I have a lot of stuff on the table, a lot of stuff planned, and a lot of stuff still in various stages of development. So. I have a lot in, I have a lot going and I look forward to entertaining all of you lovely guys, gals, non-binary pals and waterfowl. Well, this waterfowl loves to game, as you know. And I have been avidly following your UFO series because you have got some good coverage of that. Really good. And I'm not just saying that cuz he's my bestie. It's really good coverage. I try I try to call it like I see it, fam. I try to call it like I see it. I, I try, if I feel like believers make a good, you know, I say it, and I feel like the skeptics make a good point, I said it as well, and I, I've kind of got some flack because of that, I feel like, but that's just kind of who I am as a person, you know, I try to call things like I see it, especially when a situation like this, where a story's still developing, and, you know, there, there's heated passion on both sides, I try to keep myself neutral, I try to keep myself you know, my passions in check, and I try to approach this with a divorced uh, mentality. Uh, now, I sometimes I am very much more successful at doing it than others. Um, 
as you may see, uh, coming up pretty soon, where you're probably already seen by the time this video is out. Um, so, yeah, but I appreciate your viewership, ma'am. I do appreciate it. You know it. I'm your number one goose. Now, before we go, do you have anything you'd like to say to our audience? Yes. I would like to say that wherever you are, whatever you are doing, however you are living, do what you can where you are and be proud of what you accomplish. If it's the slightest accomplishment ever, if you can get one good score on your grocery bill next week, you did great. If you are absolutely just baffled and confused and anxious about how you're going to put your food on the table or get through your week when you do, give yourself credit for doing it. We don't give ourselves enough credit for the small wins. Life is not about algorithms and likes and curated pictures on Instagram or Twitter or anything else. Life is about living. Live as best you can. Give yourself credit where you do it. An 80-20 rule. If you can make it most of the time, you've done more than enough. Amen to that, fam. Let me tell you what, amen to that. That is a strong way to end us off, fam. That is a very strong way to end us off. True words have never been honked before. Honks? Honks and flaps, my dude. Honks and flaps. <laughs> so, all right, so stick around. I'm going to close this out, and I will be. I will come back to you in just a moment, okay? Thank you so much for joining us today, Honk Flap. I love to have you back on one day. All right, guys, gals, non-binary pals, and waterfowls, thank you so much for joining us as well. Be sure to follow Honk Flap on both Twitter and Counter Social at the links below. Special thanks to Fran, who does a wonderful job doing my art. She's back on Twitter, so please give her a follow. A special thanks to all my friends on Twitter. I wouldn't be here without you all. Uh, a special thanks to the lovely people of Counter Social. The Q&A session would not have been possible without you lovely guys, gals, and non-binary pals. And most importantly, a special thank you to all of you for watching. Please like this video if you like it, dislike it if you dislike it, feel free to comment below and let me know what you think. And if you like my content, please subscribe and turn your notifications on. Until next time, fam, remember, just be yourself and you'll be awesome. Peace out!